today, we have the amazing Graciela Casillas. Now check it out. She's so cool. Even look at the flowing, blowing ear. Yeah. I, I made a joke earlier. I, I, Fireboards is he's, she, she's at his school and he's under her with the little hair dryer, you know, giving her that real. We, what I do with models sometimes to get that hair flowing. So Fireboards, he's okay. Fireboards, I, I can see you kneeling down there with that hair dryer. <laughs> it's just very hot here, and we just finished. I was sweating a lot a few minutes ago working out. So oh, that's awesome. So you're filming? Yes. Yeah. Is it going okay? Is it, are you doing weaponry? Stay, I mean, I've been working on a boxing uh, sequence. And so we were just adding more courses to, to the boxing. And so just finish okay. that up. Are you done for the day filming or? Yes, you... I am. Okay. Cliff and I have a couple things that we do with this. So we're going to kick that out of the way. And that way I could just concentrate hundred percent on you afterwards. Okay. All right. So Cliff, you're on and uh, we don't have Larry with us today. So we're just going to go into our little, what the F episode. Okay, yeah, so we do this regular thing, Graciela, it's, it's called What the F, and we don't say it, but we, we know what we're saying when I say F, but it's like things that just sort of get us, like, why are people doing it? You know, like last week, we're talking about people with all the gas containers now that they're hoarding. Our, our topic this week, What the F, and we're going to go into it, masks, okay? So we're only going to spend a couple of minutes, and that's what we spend on, but we have our weekly rant about things that just bother us through the week. And now all these states are starting to open up again, which is an amazing thing. But they're talking about, all right, wear a mask if you've not been vaccinated. But all of a sudden, everybody's vaccinated. Nobody's wearing a mask now. It's really funny to see it, you know. And uh, it, I, I just think, what the F? It's crazy. I, I just hope that we're not going to resurge this. Because if you honestly have been vaccinated, that's amazing. There's people who are anti-mask. Um, but what I was noticing the day, that, so like one day, I'm going to all the stores and I have to wear the mask. And all of a sudden they say, hey, we, we got rid of the mask ban. Everyone's not wearing a mask. But what was crazy is we just started going back to uh, our gym. We have Lifetime Fitness. It's about two minutes from us. And, you know, the day before, all these young people, they're all wearing masks, working out. And, you know, I'm always I didn't even go into the gym when we were on, you know, until I got vaccinated. But I went in and then the next day, all of a sudden it says, listen, if you got vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. But all of a sudden, the whole gym, all these young kids, like 20, 22, and I know they didn't get vaccinated. They're, no one's wearing masks. And I just like, uh, really? You know, it's supposed to be on the honor system. I said, how many people are truly, have they got vaccinated? So it's kind of like, that's my pet peeve. I mean, come on, guys. It's the honor system. Don't put other people at risk, you know, who maybe have not got vaccinated yet. And, and now you say, yeah, cool. That just means we don't have to wear masks. No, remember, it was a, if you are vaccinated, you weren't supposed to have to wear a mask. Yeah. So now everyone seems to be there. All of a sudden, I know we haven't had, we've got like 3.2 million people in our state, you know, who's got vaccinated. Now it seems like, oh, everybody overnight got vaccinated because what the hell, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still a little nervous. I have an uncle who's in the hospital right now and they don't, I don't think it's COVID. They don't know though for sure, but he's been sick really bad for two weeks. And, you know, I, I just think the craziness about this is, for one, that they politicize this virus, but two, that, that you. now, you know, if there is a way out of this, that people are like squandering this one chance we might have at really, really beating this thing. You know, I don't want to end up like India, obviously, but, uh, you know, I don't think it's done and over with, and I don't want the economy no. to go backwards. You know, we're going forward. So. Anyway, what the F. So, uh, I want to get into Graciela, if that's cool. So yeah. my, my whole thing this week, we were talking about who we're going to have, who we're going to have, and I've wanted to ask her, and she was kind enough to come on. But I've got so many questions for you, and I know a lot of my people that I've talked to are just really interested in in you. You know, the way I look at it is, I don't know if you ever heard this term, plank owner. Yes, of course. Yeah. So so somebody like who builds the foundation, I feel a plank uh, builder for women's martial arts. You know, to me, I look at it, you know, like there's a few names that come to mind and they're usually people that you threw leather with. And, you know, outside of that, maybe, the, uh, well, for one, I'm going to ask you if there are other names, if I don't name them, but we had like Lily Rodriguez and, and you know, maybe Lucia Riker, but I think Lucia even came a little after your time. Um, you know, what, what are the, some of the, some of the names that you would go to? Sure. I don't know. Cheryl Wheeler. In, in the world of kickboxing yeah. or just in general? No, in your world, in your world. 
back in the day when you first came up the ranks, you know, in, in your boxing career and your well, kickboxing. Well, there weren't, there, I mean, there was a few others, but they weren't in our field. There was Malaya de Costos, who was just a trailblazer. Um, she was phenomenal and still is um, in competing as a Chinese martial artist um, and winning and, and competing against men. Um, there was, in my world, it was just Lily Rodriguez and Lucia Riker was more my contemporary. Uh, but and she was also a great fighter but for me it was always Lily Rodriguez she was the one I looked up to she was sort of she wasn't aware of this but my mentor I kind of always looked up to her and followed her lead in terms of career which she was doing she was a kickboxer but she was also a boxer and that's how I got introduced to boxing was by observing and seeing how she was um, progressing in her career Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let me ask you a question. Uh, as far as competitors, people that you were that you literally fought in the ring, who would you say kind of like kind of got you on edge? Maybe the most, the one you went, "Oh my God, I can't believe I'm in the ring." Would it would it have been somebody like Lily, or was there somebody else? Uh, Lily was in a different um, weight category than me, so I'm thankfully. I'm so glad I would not have wanted to fight her because she was just really an incredible fighter. Um, the other is Lucia Riker, which I was also, praise the Lord, she was not in my category um, because she was just vicious. And and she's a female fighter. She would be the other that I would look to and go, oh my God, she's just so, she's just so explosive. She's an incredible fighter and uh, she's mean. Um, yeah. So. I'm thankful that I never had to step in the ring with either one of those two women. Yeah, well, well uh, Lucia was my one of my sparring partners for years with Nikolai Sonyak, Eric Paulson, Lucia, I, a couple other people. We would just, every Tuesday, Thursday, we'd meet at the gym and have a couple of hours of just ring time with each other. We'd trade partners. And I got some of the, the major whoopings I've took was dished out by her. <laughs> so, you understand what I mean. She, yeah, she was great. I loved her. But um, I mean, you know, you, you, to me, you've done so much. When I think of women's kickboxing and, and, and that era, you are the first name. And I know Lily and all of them, they're all amazing, but maybe because it's my circle and you were the name that was always talked about, you know? And in New York, there's also Elba Melendez, who I did yeah. fight. And I have to tell you, she was the hardest opponent I ever had to face. And it went the distance. We fought in New York. I was defending my title there at the Westmont Horizon. And Westchester, New York, and um, she, I've always had so much respect for her. Um, she was a, a very tough fight and a very strong fighter, and she's still active in the martial arts today. That's awesome. Is she, is she out of New York, or is she? Yes. Okay. Yes, she is. So you're fighting her on home turf, great. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was really a, a very difficult fight for more than one reason, not only because, and this had nothing to do with her, but there's just so much politics <laughs> in the fight world. And even yeah. though it was a WKA championship, um, there was just a lot of issues. They were changing rules on the spot. Um, it was very, a very difficult fight. So I felt as always as a female fighter that I would have to fight even before I got in the ring, trying, yeah. trying to um, get the things that I needed done um, or being treated equally to the male competitors. And then and then we fought and uh, she had trained under PK thinking of PK type of rules. And I was trained under WK because it was a WK sanctioned fight. So, so she was used to kicking above the waist and I was used to taking the legs out <laughs> with the Muay Thai kicks. And so we had different, totally different rules, but we got through it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me ask you. Um, so with women's progression and, you know, PKA and WKA and Muay Thai and now MMA. Do you think that that would interest you to be involved in MMA today? If 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 you were back in the day, if they had that, you think that would appeal to you, or would you still prefer more kickboxing type competition? I've always believed in in the importance of being a well-rounded fighter based on range, and even before UFC existed, um, I got involved in sport jujitsu, which was a safer way of testing your fighting skills. It was based on range. You had to kick, punch, grab, throw, submit. So I like 
the MMA concept. I'm not so sure I would do it today because it's still a sport. It's not reality. It's not the street. And and when you're young and dumb, you'll do anything. I want to get in there. I want to fight. It's, you know, the, um, the victories and the journey, all the training and everything that we go through um, to get ready to step in that ring. But when I now be more educated and having more knowledge of what type of punishment you're putting your body through, uh, not to mention the possible brain damage that you could sustain, I don't know that I would do it. I think I might find a different way, but but I loved it. Um, for me, fighting gave me an opportunity to travel to different countries. It gave me a purpose to be in Thailand, to be in Japan, to be in Hong Kong. Um, you know, I'm always happy to say, you know, uh, Dominican Republic, I was the first female to ever fight there. Um, so those are memories and experiences that, that are just, it's why you do it. It's not, it's like once you step in the ring, that's kind of, it's not what you strive for. It's the entire process getting up to the fight. And it's almost, I don't want to say it's not anticlimactic, but it's, it's the process and that's that's what i miss so how would i i but i can't help it i still get excited when i see it i think darn if i were 30 years younger <laughs> i would like to be in there with her so it's hard to say you know it's hard to tell yeah i look at the shape that you're in and you just i mean you you weathered i think i i joke because like my wife yourself you, you, everybody always jokes said we think that you guys have this mirror at home that's aging because you guys are still beautiful and you still look the same and uh it, it's just i mean you. It, you know time's been really kind and i mean i know this myself i mean there's most people are like this after they fight a while you get cauliflower ear and that flattened nose and you've managed to just stay away from that and i've watched wars you've been in and and i know that i mean we all know that half the punishment you take is in, is just getting ready for the fight versus in the fight. Almost every injury that I've had has not happened when I've been in the ring. It's always been getting ready to get to that point. Oh no, and especially when you're training with men, like my entire career, I never sparred with a single female. They just weren't around. And when I, back in the day where I started, it's like you went to where the training was. I started at Hoover Street Boxing Gym in South Central LA. Then I ended up in the Olympic Boxing Gym and both of these places don't exist anymore. And then I finished up and we called it the Ali Gym because Muhammad Ali used to train there at the same time that I was there um, in Santa Monica, but it was actually the Joe Lewis Boxing Gym. But when I was with my trainer, Jimmy Montoya, and my manager, he had the largest stable in the world um, of male fighters. And the majority of them were rated in the top 10. So I had... I had sparring partners like Kid Mesa, who was a world champion, Hector Camacho Sr., who was a world mm -hmm. champion. Um, I had some of the best sparring partners and they tolerated me because they didn't have any choice. Jimmy would say, give her a couple rounds and she's getting ready for a fight. So I got to train with these top fighters where a lot of other women during that era did not have access to that type of training. Yeah, yeah. Today, I mean, I look at like an Amanda Nunes or, you know, like, uh, you know, just some of the people who are really, really on the forefront. And, and I look at kind of the path you had to, had to walk. Um, I, I, I was present for some of it. I was just a nothing back then. Not, not that I'm a great something now, but I, I was, I mean, it's so funny because I, I like, I shared those pictures of Brass Town Camp and we, we didn't, you didn't really like know me then, but I took classes with you and I, I just remembered, you know, and I'll be quite honest, I remembered a lot of the guys kind of almost like, you know, eh, you know, I'm going to go to this one or I'm going to go to that class. And I'm, I'm just thinking, what does it matter? And I see the same thing in filmmaking for women. You know, you could have a woman who's got a brilliant idea, brilliant mind. I mean, like, um, you know, uh, it's the boys club stuff. It's the boys yeah. club in a lot of places. And I look at how hard your, your path must have been just dealing with knowing something or maybe even having to present it different. You know, in the business world, I see women, if they're, if they say something other kind of, or if they, they're stern, they're bitchy. If it's a guy, he's, exactly. he's stern and he knows what he wants. So I see a woman have to present herself a lot different than, than a man just to get the same point across. And really, I don't want to say it hasn't changed all that much, 
I feel that um, there's been certain milestones in my life where, you know, for example, I was touring Australia one year with, with Cliff Stewart and Larry Hartzell and, and I had my seminars and they had theirs. And I remember one year looking up and going, wow, I have, there's a lot of students there and they were all men, majority of men. I'm not saying that Australian men tend to be more, I'll say traditional, um, different than in the US. But I thought about it after the fact and I thought, okay, I guess I'm finally starting to gain enough respect that these men had to have paid to come and learn from a woman. And to me, that was going, okay, I'm, I'm finally getting somewhere where they're starting to value that I have something to offer. But I'm not foolish. And I know that in a lot of spaces, places, they still look at women like um, they don't have that much to offer. Um, and it's always been difficult. I've always said that um, for a female, as a competitor, I had to, if the guy was doing 20 push-ups, I had to do 25 just to be seen like, okay, she's okay. And my very good friend, Cliff Stewart, taught me early on, the early 80s, when I would train with him and Larry, because it, it was always the three of us hanging out and training. He used to tell me, Garcello, when you do your seminars, this is what you're going to do. <laughs> I go, okay, take the biggest guy, take him down. I'm not going to say what he said, just jack him up. Oh, no. <laughs> He's that language, but poor anyway. big guy standing there, and all of a sudden you're like, no. yeah. <laughs> And uh, he says, that's the only way they're going to, you're going to get their attention that you have something to offer. Uh. And it was no different than fighting. When I used to fight, they would put us like the cleanup match. The cleanup match means like in Vegas, to me, it meant, okay, we're sweeping up the beer cans and picking things up and let's put, throw the women out there. And I knew that the minute the bell rang and they and leather hit leather or leather hit flesh that everybody's going to go, oh shit, they can really fight. Yeah. And that's what would happen. And that was the price I always paid. I thought, okay, they see us as, a sideshow. I had wore a little skirt. I was the first boxer to wear a skirt in the ring. And it was sexy. It was small. It was like a figure ice skater. And I knew that that's the price I had to pay to get the attention that I needed for them to say, oh, they can actually fight. And so whether it was in the boxing ring, I already knew that was a price I had to pay. The minute we started fighting, everybody would go, oh, wow, they can really, they're really aren't, they are athletes. They're not two women hitting each other right same thing in teaching and I today you know my school I had a lot more males than I'd had female because I have been around long enough that people know me and they know what I have to offer so it's not that difficult today as it was years ago but over I think women are still dealing with similar issues yeah yeah I, I, tell us a little bit about your your academy and your school and what you're teaching there now well unfortunately uh, thanks to COVID, my school stayed closed for a year. And at this point, I don't see us reopening. Um, I had a school in Oxnard, California, and I, I taught a very eclectic system, just like the two of you came up, you know, via through Danny uh, and Osanto. So and I had boxing, kickboxing, Eskrima, Jiu-Jitsu. I had Professor Jeff Lane, who's um, um, kind enough to come to my school and teach Kodakon Jiu-Jitsu. And he's a professor, incredible teacher so I luckily unfortunately drew some people and he really helped the school and um and and was with me the entire time teaching there and besides that we had Muay Thai kickboxing and so it was just a variety and then I had my seminars that I would teach my monthly giving back to the community uh, women's self-defense seminars so I know California got hit really hard I mean Arizona schools were open pretty much the entire time so uh, what are your plans then? What are you, what are you going to do? Um, my plans are to regroup. I was, I spent 20 plus years. I'm still there at our community college, Oxnard, where I retired from. Um, I developed several of the courses there that are today CSU and UC transferable, which are under PE and health. So I developed their boxing, their kickboxing, jujitsu, escrima, even Tai Chi. I don't teach Tai Chi, but I, I developed the course and brought the instructors in. And um, so I can go back to the college, which I plan to do, where I could 
um, teach out of my classroom and open it to the public on off days. And um, yeah, I'm afraid right now to open a school um, because you just don't know what's going to happen. Fortunately, um, we have colleagues like, you know, Sensei Farbors, who has this incredible school and opens his doors to instructors like myself, who has said, you know, if you want to teach, you're welcome to teach here also. Uh, but we'll see. Right now, as things are opening up, I'm just, you know, I'm hitting the seminar circuit again, and uh, I'm doing my teaching platform um, with assistance of, you know, Sensei Farbors. We're developing an online training program. I've completed all the impact weapons. I've done all the, um, you know, like stick against stick, stick against empty hand. Um, I've done double sticks. I've done all, you know, boxing series and we're just adding, and it's going to be a continuation of that. So a lot of what I've taught, it's going to be on that. And um, I'm focusing on really reaching women and teaching more street defense. That's awesome. I, I just feel that there's a martial arts school in every corner and I want to offer something to people that is not readily available from a true, from a true, I want to say not so much from a, with a pure heart, but it's, it's what women need. And it's not just a kickboxing class or a fitness class. It's something that's really going to enhance their life and maybe make a difference in their life if they're ever in a situation where they're going to have to defend themselves. So, so that's my focus. I want to jump for a second. Uh, I don't know if you know Paul McCarthy. He has cognitive uh, collie and he's out of UCLA college. He just wrote in and he just said, UCLA, UCLA martial arts would welcome you to teach exclamation point. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a lot of avenues and there are a lot of allies that you have. I mean, people recognize, uh, you know, the things that you've contributed, you know, Cliff, I don't know if you know this statement, but my father-in-law, Dan Inosanto, he and I have had uh, many talks about Graciela. And he, and I, I know I'll screw this up. And if I do, cause I know he's said it to you, but he told me, Ron, he, you know, she had wanted me to corner her and I, I just couldn't at the time and, and to develop her. And he said, you know, she's good to develop. He goes, anybody could develop Graciela. He goes, if, if you have all the colors in a palette an artist can, can make an amazing painting. And that's Graciela. When I think of her is she's got all the attributes. She's got everything that, just will total a, a, a will total out a, the come to a total of being a winner, and and she's that. I don't know if I've said it the, the same way or as eloquent as he said it, but it just struck me. I've never heard him say that about anybody on this earth outside of you. He's uh, you know like as a martial artist, he totally recognizes and respects everything that you've done in it, and it's to me, that's big kudos. You know, I, I mean, he hasn't said it about me, damn it. You know? So it's just, you know, you're, you're brilliant. And every lesson I've had with you, it's, it's just, you know, come across so clean. You're so, you're so crisp at what you do. And I think that you're an amazing tactician. So with that, the question I wanted to ask, uh, are, are you, have you, or are you, or is it something you still want to do is maybe develop fight, fighters, be, you know, be in a corner for them, anything like that? Interesting that you said that. Before you, we go to that, I just want to say that I appreciate what you've just said. And I have to say and acknowledge that Guru Dan and Asanto made such a huge impact on my life that a lot of who I am today has to do with him, with his influence, with his teachings. And, you know, we gravitate towards people that are like-minded, but what he also did for me, he's just opened up a whole world for me. And, and, you know, we always say being the pointer of the way, and he truly is that. And I will forever be indebted to him for what I've learned. And, and it's more principle based. It's not necessarily, you know, a technique, but just, just how cool he always was with the stories and, you know, after class, we'd end up in a Chinese restaurant for hours listening to him just talk. So I really do appreciate that. Um, it's interesting that you asked the other question because I'm training a, a fighter right now. My issue, um, and I didn't think I was interested in training fighters. Um, guys have come to me and have asked and I didn't have time. Up until recently, I was a full-time, not just an academic counselor at a college, but I was department chair of counseling for many years. 
And then when I was teaching at the college, I, I left counseling for about seven years, uh, trying raising my daughters with, because it gave me a better schedule as a professor. And I was department chair of PE and health. So um, doing that, and then you know how it is, you, you, you finish your eight to five job, you run home, you change, you're eating on the way to your dojo. And every night I'm at the dojo. So just didn't have time to train people. And uh, so now um, when this young man um, that I'm working with, um, just to clean up his hands, because he wants, he's doing MMA fighting, uh, I started working with him and I got excited inside. I'm thinking, well, this is really, I really like this. I really enjoy doing this. Why have I been like running from it? But it has just to do with, you know, time and avail availability. It's a huge commitment. And the few guys that I have worked with, I always tell them, look, you know, you really need to find, associate yourself with someone that really cares about you and is going to look out for you because it's a very difficult world, the fight world, whether it's boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, MMA, whatever field you're in, not only is it very political, it's that many trainers will be looking for tough fighters like you who can just hit hard, but maybe are not as experienced and they're going to use you. So you really need to make sure that the person is looking out for your best interest so that you don't get hurt. And um, so I'm working with someone right now, but I don't know. I just don't know that I would have the time to really develop fighters. Um, I'm definitely interested, you know, if I had the wherewithal to do it. Um, I, I know I'm a, I would make a damn good coach. I'm learning that because I didn't really see myself as a, as a fighters um, trainer, but I have it within me to do that. So maybe something later on yeah. I'd consider doing. It's a big commitment. I mean, to, to train a fighter and because I mean, you've got to be the coach. You've, you've got to be there almost like a counselor to motivate them when they want to quit. You know, and, yeah, it's so much work. You, yeah. you know, I've cornered a couple of people and I felt more stressed doing that than ever getting into the fight. I'm, I'm worried. You know, I almost look at it like I, I stunt coordinate. And every time somebody's about to do a gag, my, I hold my breath because, you know, I feel if they get hurt, it's on me. And I felt that way, but I still loved it. It's exhilarating, but I don't know if there's that side, if you've ever felt that, but it's just every time I see somebody in trouble, I'm like going, oh, and, and I, I can't help it. Like my, my wife will tell me, she goes, I see you can torp, you know, because I'm like doing MMA stuff and I can be like, and I'm trying to help them. And, and it's, it's just, it's, it's stress. It's straight up stress. On, on, oh, it on. is. And the closest I've come to that is when I had my school back east, in order to become a black belt in our system, you had to fight somewhere. So one of my, my first female black belts, uh, Debbie, um, in order for her to get her black belt, she entered a tough man's contest. Oh, wow. I said, <laughs> that's all there was there, West Virginia, for her to do, and uh, which was really rough. And I thought I was going to die. Uh, I think I was more nervous than she was. And, you know, you want, it's like a parent looking at the child that you want them to do well and you don't want them to trip and you're there just at the edge of your seat waiting. Yeah. Um, so I, yes, I get it. <laughs> What's your forecast on women's martial arts? Are you happy where it's going right now? I think we're, st I think we have a long ways to go. I think that women are starting to receive more recognition. Um, where I would like to see it progress further is, you know, in the, in the field of teaching where it, not just teaching, but being credentialed. And what I mean by being credentialed, it's that, that I know a really accomplished uh, female martial artists that not, don't move up the ranks because of because of their gender where there's men that come into the school and they're there a year or two or they and all of a sudden they're a fifth degree black belt and so I don't think that that is um, I think men are promoted much faster than women even though women are deserving um, that's one area I would like to see you know progress more and be more of a even playing field for women mm -hmm. um, because that has that really affects a person's self worth, right? If you think, okay, I'm doing everything the guys are. I yeah. decided to come and hang out. That's kind of cute. <laughs> yeah, but I don't receive the recognition, and yeah. so that's always been an issue. But um, I'm seeing more and more. I'm re in August. I will be inducted finally into the International Women's Boxing Hall of Fame. 
Um, and since that happened, I have been becoming more involved, looking at what they're doing. And I'm shocked to see how many female boxers there are, how it's like a whole new world that, you know, I've been away from. Um, I was there in the beginning and now it's, it's now women are fighting all over the world. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot more divisions. I remember when there wasn't divisions. I remember when you just, you took the fight. It didn't matter if the fighter outweighed you 10 pounds. The promoter would just say, Hey, you don't want to fight. Don't fight. Go. And you would go. Now, after you've been <laughs> training for months for this one fight, you're not going to walk away. Not to mention you wanted the purse. So that's changed a lot. Should women be able to fight men? Should, shouldn't we be past that? Cliff and I, the reason I ask, the reason I asked this is Cliff and I were talking about um, different things on like the, our little what the F episode and stuff. And, you know, uh, I, I'm for any, any sexual orientation. Somebody wants to, you know, I'll respect that. Um, we talked about uh, people who, who, uh, who've gone through a process and they're, they're, uh, they're coming out as female and they want to play in sports against other female, but they were once a man. Um, shouldn't it be the other way? Shouldn't a woman be able to jump in the ring with a guy if that's what she chose to, if she's in that weight class, if she, she met all those criteria? I guess, guess what we're asking is what is your opinion with transgender athletics now? Because it is a controversial subject. Well, not, that, that too, but where, I'm, where I was going is shouldn't, if that's okay, shouldn't women be able to jump in and just fight a man too? It's like, well, why, why do they have to go through an operation to do this? Yeah, but I mean, I think right now, it's, it's a, a lot of women maybe feel that it's not fair, you know, that they bring in someone who is a man because it's always been strength-based, right? In the past, women didn't fight men because they figured they weren't as strong. So if we get past that barrier, then it, are we in a position where we can say that why couldn't men and women fight at that point? I mean, that's kind of what I, I, I want to see what your opinion on that is. Call me old fashioned and call me sexist, but I don't believe women should fight men. I believe that it's a biological issue. It's not a, a sexual orientation. It's not, it, to me, it is a, a gender issue to a certain extent, because if you're born a male and you have, your body is physiologically different than a female's body. So I think that women would be at a great disadvantage fighting a man. I know this from, from personal, go ahead. But but I mean, I've been in the ring with you, and I play. You know, like you, we've never really gone gone at it. But I've been, I've been in there with uh, Lucia a lot, and I'm telling you, she could take me to task when she wanted to. You know, I I just feel if someone's willing to, like women in the military, if you're willing to fight, why not let them fight? It's gonna weed out because there's a lot of guys who don't belong. How do you you're comparing yeah. the military where you're using equalizers? Today in the military, nobody's going hand to hand. It's from it, you're fighting from a distance. You're using projectile weapons. You're using. So I don't know if that's a really well. No, where where I, where I think I was going was I've been in the ring with a lot of guys who are a lot heavier than me, and I've taken them the task. You know, and and it's like I've been in there with with some women who are just freaking out downright killers, like yourself. You know, well, you. <laughs> like but look, your whole hundred and ten pounds. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> versus some That's other guy else. versus some other guy at 110 pounds. I'm going to bet on you. See, my personal experience is that I spent a lot of years in a boxing gym and I get up every day. I'd go to the boxing gym and I would spar with guys that were not holding back. Mm -hmm. They would never hold back with me because one, the majority of them were Latinos. So they were chauvinistic to begin with. And didn't understand why I was even there. Uh, a couple of them would ask me out on a date. And when I said, I'm here to train after that, it changed. Um, you know, they, they believe that I, I belonged at home, not in, not in the boxing world. And uh, so they would hit me as hard as they could. Um, I would feel it. I wouldn't cry till I got home. Um, but the point I'm making, it's a pound for pound. Men, you're built different than I am. No, you're, I, you're talking about women that I must say are more the exception, not the rule. If we're talking about the yeah, rule, I, am. I'm, I don't I'm, feel that, generally speaking, that we should be fighting with men. That's not. Yeah, I am person. talking about the exception of the rule because I don't feel everybody belongs in a ring. Half the people I've, when I go, like I've just, 
uh, in the past, I cornered my, my stepson in Utah fighting and half the fights that I watched, I went, they have no business in that ring. And, and, you know, big or small, they, they just didn't belong there. So a lot of people really have no business, no matter what the sex is. You know, uh, to me, in my mind, if somebody's game to play, let them play. It's going to weed you out and it's going to bring out, we want the exception. I look at you as the exception to the rule. I would put your weight class against pretty much anybody else's, even at a pro level. And I bet you that maybe you'll, you know, like we could always say the age thing, but I'm talking about Graciela and her prime. I don't know if they would leave the ring. Maybe they might win, but I, I bet you they wouldn't, they'd be, wouldn't come out unscathed. It'd be a fight. And that's the way it was in the boxing ring. When I, when I would train at the Olympic, it was all men and I got my licks in, but, um, but I felt that many of them that were really good and when they got to the point that they respected me enough, to, you know, that I wasn't going away. I was coming back every day. I'd show up no matter what. They would still pull the punches slightly, maybe not to the body, but to the head. And I don't know. I think everyone has a right. And in the very beginning of my career, that was my message was I may not agree. And, and this is, you know, I always say cliches become cliches because they tend to be universal and they're sound. Let, they, let, it'd be true, right? Let me interrupt you. Were you pulling your punches or were you swinging for the fences? Oh, no, I was hitting them as far. I No, absolutely not. No, I never pulled my punches with the guys okay. because I had this That's attitude fair. that no matter how hard I hit them, I'm not going to hurt them the way they're going to hurt me. You know, Graciel, you when you said you made the, the statement, how consider me old fashioned. I don't know if the world's ready if you matched a female and male and the male in the ring was dominant and beating a female, how people would look at that. I don't know if the world's ready but, for that. But look at, Gra I mean, look, look at Lucia Riker in Holland. She was fighting guys, you know? She was I, I just don't know, like I said, how, how I would feel if I saw a man, you know, equal weight, but was in the ring taking a female for a pounding and thinking, I would still think it's a little bit an unfair advantage. I don't, you know, I don't so, know. And Cliff, what you're saying right now, if you go back 20, 30 years ago, when I was fighting 30 years ago, um, it was either Alex Wallow and Wide World of Sports um, made the comment. And also on ESPN, Al Bernstein said, you know, society is not ready to see two women bloodied. Um, when I fought Alba Cookie Melendez, we were both bleeding. I mean, there was blood everywhere. And and he was saying, we're not sure, we're not ready to see two bloodied women, you know, beating each other up. Then he says, the verdict is still out. Let the public decide. And I think, and that was women, female against female. So today, I think that, um, I don't know. I think for to each their own, if, if they want to, they should have a right to. Um, That's where I'm coming from. Personally, I don't feel like I want to get in there with you, Ron. And I know, oh, you, you know, know wait, a couple you pounds know. later than you No, yeah. but I'm realistically, I don't want to fight. My goal in life was not to prove that I was um, better than a man. I think we're I'm not saying it for that reason. Ways. I hope it's not coming out that way. I'm not saying no. it for that reason. I'm just saying it for a pure competitive point is you want to put like for me, when I fought, I didn't want an easy fight. I always wanted to be pitted and, and that they have that test. You know, and, and when I went in there, I was hoping that whoever they put me, they matched me with was going to make me earn what I got. And, and you, you were, you, you were, to me, you had a selective amount of women because it just wasn't that popular back then. It's in its infancy. So if there's some guy out there who was like, Hey, I'll trade. I have no problem with it. And you have no problem. I look at it like a girl who wants to play football or baseball against a guy. You know, I, I, we could even go to that point. I'm sure you probably might feel different about that. Why can't a girl swing a bat or catch a ball? Why does it have to be a strength factor there? You know, I, I just think that we're, I guess equality. I don't know. I, I, I just think that if somebody's willing to do it, let them do it. And if the other person says, I'll do it, then you've got a match. I don't think you're, 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 you know, if the, the public's not ready, I think they're ready now. Have you seen some of the UFC battles with some of the women who are fighting there? No, I agree. That's why I said that was 20, 30 years ago. Today, today, it's not, 
female against female, you see it all the time and you see them bloody and they're cut. And um, it's now what Cliff is, you know, was mentioning, you know, male versus female. That's what I'm not sure people are, are ready to see. Right. Well, yeah, I'm, I just don't, that's what I was getting at, Ron. Are, are they ready to see that? I know personally, when I work with the Seattle Seahawks and I would get in and, and play with the linemen, you know, holy shit, you know, I'd go, when I, cause I would be, I'd get in front of, and I run past him and go, play. I got you. I beat you. And then all of a sudden, one lightning came in and just went, wham! It hit me the side of the head. And I was like, holy Jesus, man. I mean, I, the, how the strength and the size and explosiveness. And I'm not a small guy, right? And I'm thinking, you know, you've you got to be a super strong, you know, female to, to go on, the, on, the, on an offensive, defensive line and go up against these real big, huge. I'm shaking his head. Right? But, but, no, but, but that, I, I, I think you're proving my point. We're weeding out. There's a ton of guys who don't belong in there, including me. You know, but if you got a woman who can do it, like, look, I was on I was on a sheriff's department and there were a couple of times I had to go in. Like you do your first year in the jails and there was a, 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 a female officer that was with me and I would rather have her with me any day over most of those guys. She was, she was, she was awesome. You know, I'm not, uh, you know, I mean, she was no different than you in attitude, even look, you know, it wasn't, she was like, you know, like a steroid junkie and whatever, but she could throw down and she could grab people. She knew how to handle herself. She was the exception of the rule. She yeah. should have been in that environment. It was made for her. You were made to be in that ring. And I think that you would have done just fine. If you were fighting a guy, if you were fighting, if you if your fighting weight was 120, 130 and you fought a guy 120, 130, you know, I, I mean, th th there's that factor of, I don't know if I punched that hard. I'd go in with some guys and they would just, I'd feel that my, my whole body vibrated every time I took one, but I was like, all right, I'm here for the game. I'm going to keep going. So I dug in deeper into something else in me. Now I know the public might not want to see some guy whapping on a girl, but you know what? I think after a couple of times and, and she starts giving it to him, I think you'd have a different audience. I, I just, for me, I just think that it should be equal. If somebody decides they want to get in there and if you have a promoter who says that she's ready and I think that she could do it, why not let her do it? Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not arguing on that point. I'm not saying that, that I don't agree with that. I, I think if, if, if a female wants to do it, they should be able to allow it. I just still think that the initial thing Graciela was saying that still men in general have more strength and sometimes it's not I agree with fair. that. It's not as fair. So, you know, who do you who are you gonna find, like saying pro ball that can go on the defense or offensive line that can match up to some of these guys? Is it fair to them, you know? Uh, well, you know well, let, against... let's use the UFC as the barometer. To get even to the UFC, it's not your first fight. You had to go through a lot to get up to that level. Yeah. If we have a girl, right now, if we had a man in Nunes. And she wanted to jump in there with somebody her weight being a male, her male counterpart. Would that be a bad thing? She's the exception. I don't, to the think, it, I don't think it would be a bad thing. I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking a female would be assaulted by a male. She could win, right? I don't think it would be a bad thing if there were no rules. If it were street, if it were street, then I'd say absolutely, definitely. Oh, definitely um but if it's sport if it's sport then i think it's different okay all right i mean i'll take that in i don't know if i i i, I still think that i wouldn't want to get in and have to fight amanda nunes i wouldn't want to fight chris cyborg i know chris i just posted a thing up with, with chris she scares the bejesus out of almost everybody i know you know and and i think that somebody at her weight I think that she's a formidable opponent. So why not give her that if she wants it? That's my view. I'll end it there. I don't want to beat this thing to death, but my whole view is, uh, you know, like if somebody wants this, why deny them? You know, uh, that's where, where I'm coming from. And I, and I really think that somebody with your technique, somebody, your power, somebody with your brains, I think can defeat somebody your, your, your weight. I don't care if he has a penis or not, or, you know, so, you know, it's just, I, I'll let it go. Anyway, let's go on to a new topic and get away from this. So we're, uh, we got a few minutes left, but I mean, uh, what does the future hold? Let's go there. What yeah, tell the us about your series. Okay. You've been filming a little bit more. I want to, um, honestly. Well, as I said earlier, I'm working on a teaching platform um, where I'm, I'm kind of mapped out um, everything from 
impact weapons, edge weapons, boxing, kickboxing, and street defense. And I've always, you know, I've taken principles from, all, I've been doing martial arts for over 45 years now. And every year, every year um, um, that I've trained with different people, I'm sorry, I can't hear. I can't hardly really hear. It. Sound familiar, Ron? When you were filming? This is just what I was going through filming. <laughs> I, I know. I know. I need to hear you, and I'm here. I, we um, can hear you fine. So if you just you roll. can hear me. Okay. I'm having anyway. So I have an eclectic approach to teaching, and when I started in 1980 with Danny and Asanto, I. As Ron knows, and Cliff, you know, because we kind of come from the same root uh, uh, from that point on, we always learn different things. We went through phases, you know, we went through a Muay Thai phase, we went to a Silat phase, we went to, we went to a, a, a Sabat phase, we went through, there was always different phases at the school. And as much as I appreciated the way we were learning, uh, when I started teaching, I realized that I couldn't teach like that. Um, a lot of students that started with Guru Dan already had training, previous training. When I walked through his door, I was already a world champion in two separate sports. So even though I was learning, embracing these new systems or styles, whatever you want to call them, um, it took me several years to kind of get my mind wrapped around and figure out, okay, they were always getting little pieces of a puzzle. Now this goes here and this goes there. Um, when I started teaching, it was very difficult for me to teach like that because someone who has no experience had a hard time keeping up and it didn't make sense to them. So over the years, I started developing my own curriculum based on range and I developed formulas that I felt would, would um, expedite somebody's learning uh, process. So as an example, because you're familiar with this, you take an angle one as a forehand strike coming at the side of your neck and you learn how to counter it, but then you learn how to apply a lock and then you learn how to do a disarm and then a takedown and a control all working off of the same, let's say inside deflection, but you progress. So oftentimes at the school, we talked about, oh, this is progressive, but I never, I never experienced the progression. We just got to talk about it and, and group down would demonstrate, but but I spent years and I had help us, you know, with other people like my friend Cliff, and we would really dissect things and go, okay, this is where this fits. And so that's the way I developed and I based it on range. And whether it was impact weapons, whether it was edge weapons, whether it was empty hand, and basically structured it. So, you know, there's really, I mean, there's only so many ways I can position my fist, horizontal, vertical, whatever. So the point I'm making is there's only so many ways you could throw a punch. No matter what system you are, no matter what style, whether it's Choi Li Fat or Shotokan Karate, the fist is gonna be somewhere in the same position. So it doesn't really matter uh, from that perspective. So it's how you deliver the information. And I thought that it needed to really be principle-based and so my program does that. I feel like it. Um, you don't have to spend 10 years to learn or five years that, you know, yeah. it will quickly take you through it. And so I'm doing an online training where I'm going to offer the specific courses or someone could, you know, have a subscription and every month we'll be doing different things. And that's basically where I'm at right now with that. And besides that, you know, traveling, doing seminars. Now that things are opening up again. <laughs> yeah. And then you have a, a couple of books out and I wanted to push. Oh, you really. think I'd have my book here, right? But I don't. I, mean, I, I know. Haven't. I'm so sorry. But well, you know what? I'll, I'll get pictures of them. I'll post them up on here. We'll yeah, we I, always I, rebroadcast this and I'll make sure that that that's on there. So my book is The, the Lioness Within and it's more of a book focusing on the mental and the psychological aspects of defending yourself. It's not really... It's not so much one of these how-to, step-by-step. It's more reading material that hopefully, you know, you can learn something that will make the difference, whether it's developing situa situational awareness or just kind of looking at, you know, different aspects of defending yourself. Yeah. And then uh, your other book, wait, wait, I, I have to remember the title. What is it? Everything, uh, oh, oh, I'm going to mess it up. What it's is the it? same Every book. It's 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 a personal it's a personal guide to 
women's self-defense. It's a, I always say it's a book, a women's self-defense book that every man should read. That's it. That uh, Yeah, I couldn't think of the name of it. And, and, and it's true. You know, uh, uh, one of my big things going back onto this man-woman thing, uh, you know, they'll always say, oh, a woman can't do that. A guy's bigger. I go, right now, what if you had to fight Josh Barnett? What if you had to fight Boss Rutten? You know, it, 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 you you, you got to figure out a way and come up with something. And it's like, I think as a male teacher, put yourself in that area and just say, uh, for a lot of people, it's like, that's not going to work for a girl. Make it work, figure out a way. And I kind of feel that's a lot of your attitude is just as, as an educator, you know, especially the disparity in size or force that a man might have over a woman. There, there's always a path. There's always a yin to the yang. And that's kind of what I get out of you. That's why I strongly believe that women should always have an equalizer, <laughs> whether it's a, a stick, a blade, blade is a great tool. And <clears throat> something I've always said, and it's, it's not my original thought, but from training with Cliff and Larry in the early days, um, I would work out with them and they would have me, whatever it is we were working on. Cause you remember Larry, how he was like to, he liked to grab a lot and he was kind of tough. He, he's a tough guy, right? And they would show me something new and I'd say, come on guys, look at your arms or the size of my thigh. I, you can make that work, but I'm not. And Cliff would look at me and say, you know what? If you could make this work, it's what I'm gonna use in the field. And and that's an awesome at way of looking at it. That's and cool. he and said, by the way, guy. yeah, Cliff Stewart, I mean, th th you know, cause like I said, I've, I've always been a pretty decent sized guy, 235, right? They would refer to him as Big Cliff and me as Little Cliff. <laughs> he's high behind Cliff. Yeah. I love he's him. He's like this Cliff. gentle giant. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I was I was roommates with Larry, so I suffered his wrath a lot. You know, <laughs> I, I just remember this is pre Diana, but I had a date one time, and I was all dressed and nice, and I, I equated to Clouseau and Cato. You ever watch the Pink Panther? Because I came out, I went to leave, and he dove on top of me, and I'm like, Larry, no, no, and he just whoop me from one end of the room to the other by the time i got to the door to leave i was like damn it i gotta go take another shower and change clothes because he just wrecked me you know but um yeah but the point he was making was that if i could make it work then it's going to be effortless for him yeah no that's and a great way to look at it is what cliff stewart said that's amazing what a loss huh i love yes. it yeah yeah we lost so many people, you know, like, uh, you know, I did your, uh, your last camp pre COVID and, and Cliff was there and Colin was there and they're gone now. And I, I kind of freaked out thinking about it a little bit, you know, it's just know. what a loss, you know, both awesome, amazing martial artists, you know, Kalindi, uh, Kalindi was, um, uh, would come up to Guru Dan's and I always remembered he would, uh, Guru Dan would pull him out there and he would show like something and he would say, Clindy, show them. And he would open these like African manuscripts and all the techniques that we were doing, he could see it existed. You know, all these people were saying, oh, I made this up, made that up or came up with it. He would always pull Kalindi out there and have him show, show us all the stuff. And he goes, we're just reinventing it. And it reminded me, Grudan said when Lacoste was alive, he would say, hey, look, Manon, look what I made up. Look what I, you know, look what I created. And he goes, Dan, it's great. You think yourself one genius. You're not, it's been done before. You know, and what it's, did he say? He, he said you just rediscovered it. <laughs> yeah, you rediscovered right. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and for those people who don't know, Kalindi he taught African arts, African arts, and it's yeah. incredible. But yeah. Yes, it seems surreal this past year when I think about Kalindi being at my dojo and Cliff oh, being there and you being there and yeah. And, you know, I, I guess I'm next. No. No. <laughs> and yeah. just for people to know, late August or actually mid-August, I've been working with Mike Bowser and Meredith. We are going to be doing yeah. a really nice um, memorial for, for Cliff Stewart. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to do uh, um, model mugging with Mike Bowser. Oh, my and, and Meredith was my private student for a while. They're awesome. I love those two. They're, They're great amazing. people. A lot of people don't know, if you don't know who Mike Bowser is, um, uh, Don Drager. Do you know that he he oh, was? Oh yeah, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, unique history. I'm like, why are you in my class? Because Mike would train with me. I'm like, why are you training with me? You know, he's an I, incredible, accomplished martial artist, but he's oh, just so quiet. And, yeah. And jujitsu. He's a professor in jujitsu too. He's. Yeah. Yeah. Very accomplished people. Just just brilliant. It's so cool. So I think we're close to uh, at our hour. Um, 
I want to, before we close out, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, post all your info for the online training. I'm going to really, really press, press people to, to go with you because I think the only per person you're cheating by not doing it is yourself. If you're going to pay for all these other people, this woman has how many years in the martial arts? I mean, even competitive. <laughs> She's probably forgot more martial arts than most people know, you know, and um, I, I think that you're a treasure and I'm so Thank happy you. That you came on with us. So Thank you. Thank you for um, having me on here. Yeah, I love it. You want to add anything, Cliff, before we close this out? Well, uh, so you remember when I saw you, what was it, in 2019, right? That was our last camp, Mars camp, was it? Right. 2019? And we're walking back camp. to lunch and I told Gracia, I said, you know, I kind of had this crush on you back in the day. <laughs> we all had a crush on her back in the day. She's beautiful. She's a badass. But, yeah. you know, I never told you when, remember in Brasstown, we were, there was this French um, uh, magazine and they came in and they go, hey, we're, I want to do this thing. We'll take you and Graciela and we'll go out on the raft or somewhere. And you want to do the shot. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get to go photograph around with Graciela. I was like, I was like a little kid in the candy store. So excited about that. Well, I'd never I had no that. idea. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I get to go out and do this. Yeah, so. I just uh, found more photos. You just look so, I always saw you as this really intense, almost mean looking guy. Yeah, look at him now. I saw you. <laughs> I, with that photo of you with the, anyway. The bandolier, <laughs> yeah. The old Rambo photos. Yeah. 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 I, I just recently, I just recently found more Brass Town photos of all of us. So I got to get those to you guys. You know, of both of you there. And I was, a, I mean, I was just some little, how old was I? God, I was probably 20, maybe eight, no, 19. That was such a great camp. That's probably yeah. all the camps over all the decades that I've been to. That's by far my most favorite. Yeah, you can end pain. It was so much fun. Bert Poe, oh my God, yeah. yeah. I got I got to spend a lot of time with Bert Poe later. You know, uh, uh, just... It was such a crew, what a time. The whole vibe, everything else was just such a different feel, you know, compared to where, where it's at now. It was just fun. That's the only word, like, I, I mean, politics is always gonna exist everywhere, but it was really pre- I remember we would pile all into a big bus and go over to this Georgia side for breakfast. Yeah, do you remember the shooting range? Did you do all that? You were doing all that. I remember that with Larry. And, and um, the runs with Chai and he'd make us lay down in the river afterwards. Yes. Yeah, or the, or the firework fight. Were you there for that? Firework fights. We were attacking everybody's tents. Pitching yeah. Tents for two weeks. I don't know if the first time we did it, it was camp was almost two weeks long. Yeah. Crazy. You know with how times have changed so much? Because I remember, you know, we're going to do shooting at the Brass Town. So I go, okay. You know, I took my SIG 226 back and you know what I did? I mean, I stuck it in my briefcase and I totally forgot. When I got on the plane, I flipped my briefcase and I had my SIG set right there. I mean, that's how much we've changed on security back in the day. And I was like, yeah, oh, nobody crap. noticed. I check that in. I was going to check it in at the airport. And I was like, open it up. Oh my God, it's right there in my briefcase. I, I remember back then we drove, uh, Larry Lindemann and I, and I had this Corvette and I thought I was so cool. It broke down on us and a fan belt went. And we're in, you know, like Timbuktu somewhere. And they're like, we don't have found a fan belt like that. And we had our guns, everything inside. I'm like, I can't leave this. What am I going to do? And we had to have this fan belt shipped. And so it took us an extra three days to get home by the time this fan belt came. And we were stuck in a little cheesy motel with, you know, just training. That was fun too, but just craziness. It was just a good time. To me, it was a different time, different feel in the whole martial art world. And, and, and I would love to bring back that feel. And I have those camps and I, I try to make them fun and more family orientated, but it's still not the same it's never going to be the same like it was it was just you know it almost reminds me of rock music you can make it now but when we were kids and we heard that the first time you know, like like really heard like a, a zeppelin song my son will say you know like he'll compare music and i go yeah it's different it's different back then you know and it was for martial arts just a different time it was awesome i love it so all right let's close this out you go back to work and uh make some good video and thank you uh, I, 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 I will make sure that all your info is listed on this. Um, wait, somebody, I have to close out. Somebody just wrote me and said, uh, this is another episode that needs a part two. So people want you back. So. Yeah. Hey, beautiful. When I come out, I'll, we'll do a photo session together. Great. Okay, thank good. you. Okay. Bye. All right, thank you. Deep respect, deep bow. And uh, 
Women should have the right to fight anybody they want. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to close that out. So, bye, bye everybody. Thank you, Cliff. Next All week. Right. Next week. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Love you both. Bye-bye.